That's all it was. I was hurt and I had an ego and I was trying to fill it with anything I could. And it really took a moment of me going, dude, what, what, what am I really missing? Like, what, what, why did I have an ego? What's that void? What's this like, why do I feel the need of, of getting love through praise of a following? Why, why did I feel like I had to be the biggest pro skateboarder to be valued, right? And when I started working through those issues, I got to a place where I could actually do what I felt like I was meant to do. And it wasn't a realization for me. It was me going through this and getting a phone call that triggered an idea. You're listening to the Wake Up Wealthy Podcast, the only podcast that helps you turn pro in mind, body, spirit, and business. What is up, Wake Up Wealthy listeners? It's your host, Brody Kern. Welcome to the Wake Up Wealthy podcast, where we bring you individuals killing it in the areas of mind, body, spirit, and business. Today, we have on Mikey Taylor. Mikey, how are you? I'm doing good. Thanks for having me. Absolutely, man. So, you know, you just recently came on to the scene here in this social media entrepreneurship space. Now, I know you because, uh, you know, I was a fan of skateboarding when I was young, but why don't you tell... Why don't you tell the listeners a little bit about who you are, where you uh, where you first made your name, and how you ended up on this call? Yeah, so uh, my name is Mikey Taylor. Uh, I was a pro skateboarder for about fifteen years, uh, and that was that was my life. My life was just like skating, build you know as many followers as I could within skating, have my own product. Uh, that was all I was focused on, and uh, and through that journey, uh, you know, social media hit which became a new platform for us to uh, showcase our tricks, right? And so, you know, I started really building social media and really what I wanted was like, tricks were so hard for me that I wanted as many people as possible to see them, right? I was just like, you know, if I'm gonna put this much work into this, I I want as many people to just put eyes on it. And then as I started exiting my career, uh, my social media just naturally took a turn um, through that journey of me being a pro skateboarder, I was always trying to figure out how to uh, transition out of it when my time was done. And right. uh, my answer to that problem was starting companies. And, and that really became my new passion was uh, brand building. And then, you know, it just, my social media naturally just kind of turned into that when, you know, my day-to-day uh, activity became building my brand and not, you know, filming a trick. So what yes. led to this, like trying to crack this entrepreneur world and, you know. Right. right. So let's, uh, let's dial, it back, dial it back a little bit. Cause I mean, I, I, I heard your story. We connected last week and there's a lot of, there's a lot of real value to be had there. So like for me, you know, and professional skateboarders might see it differently, but for me, you came up in like the golden era of skating. Like I'm sure a lot of people see that as like Tony Hawk, Steve Cavallaro, those dudes coming up, creating competition. But for me, dude, you came up right when like skating was like hitting mainstream. Like that's when this yeah. shit was cool, you yeah. know? And so, I mean, tell me a little bit about that. Like when did you start skating? So I started skating in 96, 97 when it, when it was real pretty, it was still pretty small. Uh, when I started getting sponsored, uh, that's when kind of this Tony Hawk pro skateboarder, uh, skateboarding hit the mainstreams. Everyone owned a skateboard happened. And, uh, you know, it, my first year as a pro was small. My second year as a pro is when it hit mainstream and it just, uh, dude, it was crazy, man. We were all going, I can't believe this is happening. Like we're like the shit now, right? Because in high school we were lame. Like nobody, we, we weren't cool kids, you know? Right. And so for me, like, you know, like I, I just, I love seeing the landscape of things. And even when I was a kid, you know, I was a pretty normal kid who liked to skate because of, you know, obviously the mental game that goes into skating, which we'll talk about. But like, yeah. even the kids around me who skated, like seemed to be kids who like, drank 40s and broke shit you know like it was just not like cool no no it was not cool man in high school i had five friends the football players the baseball player that they hated us they fucked with us and then all of a sudden i graduate high school two years later like i'm like a thing it was the, it was just such a crazy experience going from like nobody liked us to like now we're like the cool kids you know right right uh, let me ask you this what kind of what kind of family environment did you grow up in like from a financial standpoint uh, from a financial standpoint, middle class, uh, maybe like my dad. So my dad was a photographer, shot, shot okay. weddings. Uh, in LA, he, you grew up in LA. Grew up outside of LA. Yeah. Southern okay. California. And, uh, he was, uh, like in our neighborhood, we always made the, like from like a annual salary standpoint, I think my dad made less than everyone, 
but my dad was so good with money that we were always in the nicer neighborhoods. Gotcha. Yeah. He's just, just, my dad's always had like a very uh, healthy grasp on what money was, how to spend it, how to grow it. Uh, well, the, re the reason I asked that question is because, you know, so did you guys travel much when you were growing up? Never. Right. So, I mean, you're shooting all over the world probably once you got sponsored. Yeah. Yeah. So I went from like, uh, I had gone out of the country one time when I was a kid uh, and that was basically it. Uh, and then had like the family trip to Hawaii one time. Right. And then all of a sudden, you know, by 23, I'd been around the world like three times. By 26, I, I started to go to places like six, seven, eight times. It, uh, it was crazy, man. That, those first like experiences traveling the world actually, I think, are so eye-opening and took my like little suburb view on like what life is and really like made it so much more macro, you know? Right. Yeah, dude, that's, in that's interesting. I know because for me, so my family and I, we, you know, we grew up middle class in Missouri, which is like not, you know, and my parents had me at 17. So they, you know, they did the okay. best they could and it was all cool. Okay, okay. We never traveled. Like we took like, I played really competitive baseball growing up as well. So we would yeah. like drive to other, you know, Nebraska, Kansas, yeah. Michigan, play other big teams, yeah. Colorado uh, once a year. But like travel was off the, you know, there, that just wasn't in the picture. And yeah. then I start, when I like got, I started traveling when I got into college and then my wife and I traveled a bunch um, over the last few years. And it, it was such an, I, like, I've just, I've learned a ton of shit just about, you know, like you said, the culture more. and yeah. Right. Like I'm just not that important. <laughs> totally, man. Makes me feel so small. <laughs> right. And you know, for me, it's almost relieving because I'm I, like, God, especially like us as like entrepreneurs, young guys, like, you got this fucking ego and all this shit going on. It, it like re it really grounds me. And like, I see the e ego bothers me, dude. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm totally with you on that one. So, okay, so let, let's keep going. So you're skating, right? You're traveling the world, skating, loving it. But yeah. now, here, here's the thing that was happening with skating at that time, right? Like, first time guys like you had started to make any sort of money, right? Yeah, yep. You, where, what did you start to do with it? And what was everyone else doing? With it? That's a great question. So with our industry blowing up the way it did, we had no previous, uh, uh, guidance on what to do with money, right? Pro skateboarders weren't making money before us. So like, you can imagine like what, what we we're all doing. It was like, everyone was buying cars. Everybody like became like, like from the outside looks super successful. Right. Well, I think a lot of these guys probably lacked guidance in general. Like you and I talked yeah. about before, skating totally. attracted a, a certain type of kid. And I, I was asking why, and you brought a really interesting point. You told me because, it, I mean, it's just low barrier to interest. You know, 75 bucks to get a skateboard. Exactly. Anyone could skateboard, right? Right. Anyone. So, you know, I think anyone could skateboard and skateboarding always had that rebellious, like, yeah. vibe to it, right? So it attracted, you know, a lot of kids that came from nothing. It was just like you know, that didn't resonate with kind of conventional sports that like were kind of getting in trouble, right? So like, yeah, not a lot of them had guidance and we're, like it's a young young thing, right? Like, like you don't have 40, 50 year old pro skateboarders, right? This is like a youthful uh, industry and culture. So no, there was no guidance. Um, I think for me, like I was just always so scared about what came after skating. Right. Like, I, I, I don't know if it was like my dad, my parents. Seeing That's what I was going to ask. Are, Where does that come from? You know, you know what, man, the only thing I could explain it to is them. Right. Because like, I didn't have uh, much understanding other than what I grew up in at that point. Right. I was still so like moldable that, uh, yeah, I think like that's what it was. And my mom like is more of a fearful person. Right. Like, just gotcha. to be honest, love her. Right. Never oh. felt like I wasn't loved by her. But but fear, fear was a big part of our life, right? And, and I think having that, I was always just scared about what happened. There was a, a element to where like, you know, I felt like fear held them back, which drove me crazy. So like, I was always trying to like go against the, you know, the voice in my head, but the voice in the head was there. And like, I think what am I going to do after skating was just always uh, just a huge thing for me. So like, I was always scared to spend money, you know? Yeah, that's interesting. So, you know, my next question was, what was your, what was and what is your relationship with money? Like me coming out of, um, you know, a lower income family and then, you know, there was a lot of fear and expectation that I had wrapped up my self-worth into all, into money and like, 
dude, I had a terrible relationship with money until I had to go through that and learn that the hard way. Yeah. Yeah. You know what, man? It's, it's funny. When, when I get asked questions like that and I look back, a lot of how I view money, the world, it, a lot of it came from skating, right? Like the money thing with skaters, like skaters aren't flat by nature, flashy people. They're not people that brag. They're not, a lot of them think right. success is whack, right? It's more about like passion and drive. So there was a part of it that I never wanted to brag about what I had. And I felt like me buying flashy shit was that right. So like, I, I think I like just from the skate community learn that like, you don't show off shit. Right. Two, uh, the, even though my friends are spending, a lot of them didn't necessarily save. I don't think a lot of them had guidance on, uh, what to actually do with their money. There was one thing that I started noticing as I started getting, uh, I don't want to call it fame, but people started paying attention to who I was, right? When people started paying attention to who I was, people started treating me different. And, and all of a sudden, like doors started opening for me. People liked me before they knew me, right? And I always surrounded myself with my friends. And I remember like at an early age, it drove me crazy that somebody would be so nice to me, look at my friend, think they were nobody and be a dick to them right? Drove me crazy. And I think it like put this like sense of like, you know what? I don't ever, I don't like when people treat my friends like that. I don't want people to treat me like that. So I was like against anyone knowing what I had. I didn't want anyone to know I was famous. I didn't want anybody to know I had money. It became this like almost like recluse style in the beginning. And, and even though like I've, I've kind of tried working my way out of that now, I think a lot of that played into the way I spent money as well. <laughs> You know, that's interesting. You said something there, like skateboarders are not flashy guys, like in the way that, you know, other athletes are. And you're right. I mean, they wear fucking shoelace belts and shit. Yeah, totally. You, you know what I mean? So that, that, that is very interesting. So, okay, so you're, you're making this money. You're very young, traveling. What were you doing with your money? Let's get into that. All right. So <laughs> I, uh, I didn't think, I didn't know how I could make money aside from riding a skateboard. And I started making good money. So, so at a young age, I kind of felt like this might be the most money I ever make is this Windows a pro skateboarder, right? Which is- You had the fear. Deal. You had the fear. Super scary, right? Like how the fuck, like I, I make money doing kickflips, dog. You know, like <laughs> that's like into me making money outside of that. So like I was scared. I, I mean, really dude, one, one, sta one stair set goes wrong on a video and you're fucked. Oh, so much, right? I get hurt. It all goes away. I'm irrelevant. It all goes away. There's so many variables to my career ending. And I, I always felt like I had no control, which drove me crazy. I had no control over a sponsor saying, nah, we don't like you anymore later. None of it. Yeah. Right. So it was like, there was so much like that was out of my hands that I think added to the fear of me being able to make money. So when I actually had it, it was like, okay, I need to figure out what to do with it. Right. I need to like give myself as much of a cushion as possible if something happens. But but one thing my dad did tell me or teach me was like a cushion is just a cushion. Money a lump sum of money is just a lump sum of money. Right. What you really need to do is make your have your money work for you. Right. And I took it so little. I was like, all right, let's fucking go get it. Like if I could save a hundred grand, I want that hundred grand to make me money. If I could save two, I, that was my whole goal was always have my money make money. And a big thing for me was investing in real estate. That was like something that my dad had done. That was something that like I saw all the wealthy people around me invest in do. Uh, and there was something that about a tangible asset that felt like control, even though back then it didn't always translate into control. It just felt like it. Right. And that's why I started investing in do. And when I, when it started working, it just gave me more confidence that this is the right tool. And then having gone through the 08 recession and seeing what, what, you know, the things I was investing in real estate and how that performed opposed to the other uh, classes I was investing into, it was like, yo, this is my vehicle. I'm, I'm running with this guy, you know? Right. So let's, so let's talk about your vehicle that you used early on because, you know, a lot of, a lot of young guys follow me, right, who want to, uh, you know, really figure out their way. When they, with the state of social media and talking about real estate right now, right, like guys, when they hear I started investing in real estate, like all they really know is terminology of like, Maybe he was wholesaling, right? Maybe people were, maybe he was buying single family and flipping it, right? Maybe he got into a little bit of multifamily. Like, what were you doing? And I know it was none of those things, right? So yeah. that's why I want to have you talk about it. Great question. So for me, I had my career. My career was skateboarding. My passion was skateboarding. My main focus was skateboarding, right? 
So I wasn't out, it, 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 I wasn't trying to figure out what I could physically go do to make money. I was looking at things that I could invest in passively that would make me passive, passive income, right? The thing is, the opportunities that were brought to me really due to my, uh, uh, Randy, who was my CPA and CFP, who was managing my money, he brought me uh, uh, a fund to invest in the storage units. And, and they, were, they were repositioning assets into storage. Uh, that was just the first thing that was brought to me in an age where uh, I, didn't, I didn't know any better, to be totally honest with you. I didn't right. know the difference between residential. I didn't know the difference between commercial. I didn't know why storage worked as opposed to nothing. I'm being completely transparent with you. I just really trusted Randy. And then once I started seeing it and then started getting older, uh, then I started seeing how, how the different asset classes worked. And then now to what I'm doing, doing today, there's a certain things that I prefer to invest in you as, as, uh, instead of others. Uh, but I do a lot of, I do like a lot of things in real estate. It's kind of one of the beauties about real estate is there's so many different assets that you can invest in you. Uh, which is cool, but can be dangerous as well. It, it gives yeah. you this like, oh, do this one and this one and this one. Which yeah, and we'll, 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 we'll get into that conversation too, because I, I want I want to really have you talk about how you are positioning um, asset classes in the fund, because I think you're hedging risk in a really really smart way that I like. Yeah. Um, so we'll talk about that in a little bit. So, but I want to stay on the timeline here, right? So you yeah. are, you know, you, you started investing in funds because of this guy Randy. Turns out great for you, right? You know, you, money starts making money. The goal was being achieved, right? Like, what was your, where Let me, your head? It, it, just to give you a little bit more, uh, uh, just so, so we can dive deeper. Yeah. At this point, every dollar was not going towards real estate. If, if you look at the total portfolio, uh, it was still balanced. I still was investing in stocks. I was investing into retirement plan, which I, I feel a different way about now, but <laughs> I was still um, investing in different classes. Right. Real estate was just the heaviest of them. Like you look at my portfolio now, I'm probably pretty close to 65, 70% real estate. Right. Uh, but at, at that, dude, it, it depends on the age you ask. If you ask at 23, I knew nothing. 24, knew nothing. I didn't really start diving into all this till 27, 28. Uh, right. I was just like, I trusted, I trusted this guy. And I would get my annual reports and go, oh yeah, I made... You know, at that point I was, you know, stoked on anywhere between, you know, five and 8% annually. You know, I'm like, oh yeah, I'm killing it, I'm killing it. But I had no idea I'm not on the inner workings of it. It wasn't right. until I started getting into uh, starting my own companies where it, it started making more sense and I found more interest in wanting to know about it, which changed, <laughs> uh, changed my whole world. Right. And so what was the first company that you started in? What age was that at? So the first company, the, technically the first company I ever started was a backpack company called Bravo. Uh, and I was, oh man, 20, 28. I was old in the world right. of entrepreneurship. Right. Yeah. So what, what happened, what happened with Bravo? I, I so, don't know about that. Okay. So, uh, this, this is actually a funny story. So I, I get married at 27, right? Okay. When I asked my wife, when I asked my father-in-law now, my wife's dad for, uh, you know, his approval to marry his daughter, he said, well, let's talk about your future, man. What are you, what are you going to do after skateboarding? He said you do kickflips for a living. Yeah. Right. And this is a, dude, this is a successful dude. Right. And, and that's what, that's what he wanted to know. What are you going to do after, what are you going to do after skateboarding? And I was just like, gave him some bullshit. Like, I don't know. I could always just start a company. I had no idea what that meant. Right. Then I get married and my wife, like bless her heart. She did it in such a good way, but she was like, Hey, look, you don't need to figure this out now. I just want you to like actually start thinking about it. What is next? Like, I know you're like planning for these things, but like, what is the actual thing you're going to do? Right? right. And so like when she said that to me, I think she knew me to know that like when somebody puts an idea in my head, I obsess over it. So like I go out that next weekend to shoot a photo with Atiba, who's a, a super famous skate photographer. And we had both ridden for a company called Ogeo, which made backpacks, and they ended up canceling their skate program, letting us go. So I'm shooting a photo with him. He's telling me like, hey, dude, I think I have a connection over here. I'm going to call them, try to get a sponsorship. Should we do this? And what comes out of my mouth? Nah, let's just start a company. <laughs> right? And because like, it was like my wife. Like a couple days later, later after the conversation? Seriously, three days later, I have no idea what I'm doing. Right? <laughs> let's just start a company. 
uh, what? Yeah, like, fuck that. Let's not build other people's brands. Like, let's do it ourselves. No idea what's coming out of my mouth. Just let's go do it, right? So him and I, like, go down this, this process of creating a brand. Three weeks later, the same scenario happens. I get with another buddy. Yo, let's do this. Okay, let's do this. We're going to start another brand, right? It was just chaos. And then about, gosh, six months after that uh, is when I went out to go shoot a film with Josh, who uh, was a surf filmmaker, where the idea for St. Archer came, the craft brewery we did, right? right? I'm always in this, like, I'm in the mode. Let's start a brand. Let's start brands. So uh, it was like, you know, I really didn't start learning about what the fuck I was doing until we started St. Archer. Gotcha. So let's, so uh, let's talk about St. Bravo. Archer. Yeah, Bravo was the first company, but Bravo didn't officially get going until after we started St. Archer. Just, uh, dude, we didn't know what we were doing, man. It was just like skate kids wild, you know? Right. So, I, I mean, like, did Bravo make sales? Like, what happened? So, Bravo is alive now. It's a full backpack line. We're like... You know, it, it, we do pretty well with it. it. It ended up turning into a real brand. <laughs> oh, no shit. Great. I don't yeah. know why I don't know it then. Um, yeah. So, okay. So, you you know, you got, you really did like this idea of brand building. That happened, right? Before we move into St. Archer, because you were talking about this. How old were you when social media hit? So, okay. So, I, I'm going to take you a step, step behind that. W what happened yeah. for me is I got my own signature shoe. Mm, right? Yeah, big deal. My big deal in the skate world. That's the game. It's the biggest deal is where we make money, right? right? And so we make a royalty off skateboards, which, you know, a shop might buy two different graphics a month if you're lucky. It's not that many units, right? But and when they, they buy them at 20 bucks a piece. And they buy them at 32 bucks, right? Gotcha. So we make two bucks a board. Yes. Yeah. But when you sell shoes, they, they order typically three to six different colorways in every single size and a lot of times they double or triple up on size so the amount of units you're doing is through the roof so me getting a big shoe was like yo this is huge and so i got my first royalty check was which was my first like huge check right and i was like oh my gosh i want more of this and so i started getting into like uh wanting to know how i could sell more which was how do I market my shoe better? How do I design it better? What, how, how do sales apply to this? And that's when I started being obsessed with the inner workings of product. And then it was like, it snowballed into my wife in this conversation and then starting a brand. And really, I didn't understand what starting a brand meant back then, but I did have the pain point of what it felt like to build other people's brands, right? My whole job was based on me marketing other companies. And so I knew what it was like to be relevant to like bring a whole ton of money and focus into a brand. And when they were done with me, I don't get to participate in any more upside. Yeah, so, you were just like a, a, show, a show horse. It's exactly what it is. So it was like I had the pain point. Uh, I just didn't understand really what it meant to start a brand. I had no idea. I thought it was, I have no idea what I thought, you know. Right, but I mean, here's the deal. Like you, you did it. You know what I mean? Like not every skater or every person, it, barely anybody has the tenacity to do so and succeed. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? I think like with me, and I'll just be completely honest, uh, I've, I've always been the dude that like, like if I just think of an idea and I never act on it, I will drive myself crazy wondering if it would have happened. That, that is torture for me. So I've just always felt like, you know what? It's better if I just go for it and fail and know fuck, didn't work. Then like to like torment myself for years going, dude, that one idea, that one idea could have been the thing. I'm just not built for that. So I think like knowing that I've just always put myself in situations to go, you know what? I'm going for it. Might not work, but I'm at least going to try, you know? Yeah. I love, I love that. I mean, that's how I am. That's how a lot of people that you see you find success are like, I mean, dude, I am like, for me, my biggest quality is really that I'm just like brutally persistent to a fault. That's like it's a great thing that you hit me back quickly because like I would have fucked your DMs up. Yeah. And like yeah. some people that I want to get on the podcast, they don't like it. Like if, if they eventually get to know me, they just know that that's how I am, right? But like, yeah. dude, I just won't stop. Yeah, yeah. I'm very similar, man. It's like I'm, I get very obsessed and, and, and I'm very comfortable in failing. Like really when you break down skating, we fail so much. Right. So it's like, I think having somebody who's like, 
uh, obsessed, not scared to fail. It's only a matter of time until you succeed. I don't know my timeline. That's the one thing I don't know. It might take me 20 years. It might take me two, but I'm going to fucking figure it out. So let's talk about that because I mean, dude, so I have always loved skating. I, I did not skate from 15 to 24 due to baseball. I was really good at baseball. I was an okay skater. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. um, but skating dude, skating taught me a lot different. And I like that I grew up having the aspect of team sports and like an individual thing like skating, but I learned yeah. so much from skating because like, dude, you get out there and I, I skated every day. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like a lot. I was trying to be yeah. good and shit. Yeah. Like you go out there, you got to hit like a certain, like I had to hit my bag of tricks in a row without fucking up before I would like go inside and some nights dude, it'd be late like that. Like, what did you really learn from skating? Like, I know, like, that just going to war every day. Yeah. So, so yeah. And l let's make sure we touch back on the team sports. Because I fell in love with skating because it was all about myself. Mm -hmm. Which taught me a lot, which we'll talk about. But I just want to just, so we don't forget to touch on this. What I lacked was working with other people. Because right. it was all about myself. But just to, uh, to answer your question, uh, skating was always hard for me. I in my group, I was the worst. I took the longest to do tricks. It was m nine times a 10, a mental and physical battle for me to learn tricks. Right. And, and then to take it a step further, when we filmed tricks, our whole world was based around filming video parts, right? right. Which was about a two, two and a half minute edit of the best tricks we can compile. And a lot of times it took us three years to film two and a half minutes. Right. right that line, like you, you've got guys hitting, I mean, five tray flips in a row and then like, not leave back heel down 12 stairs. Yeah. And the thing, and dude, and, and, and the thing about skating is you can't do the same trick twice on a spot. Right. So you can imagine how difficult it gets and, and how quick the bar is raised on what type of tricks you have to do. So for me, a lot of times I would try one trick down a set of stairs or down a handrail for three hours, the same trick. And it would just be failing and failing and failing and pain. And my body saying stop until I landed the trick. So for 15 years, 20 years, that was my process of, okay, it's going to hurt and I'm going to mess up a whole lot more than I am going to succeed. And so it was almost like it, it, it built this machine in me that goes, you know what? It doesn't fucking matter how bad it hurts. It doesn't matter how many times I mess up. All that matters is that I land it once. That's all. And so I just, it's just, that's, that's what I was taught. So now it's like in anything I do, whether it's a relationship, business, whatever, that's my mentality. I don't care how many times I mess up. I don't care how long it takes me to succeed. I will succeed one time and that's a win, you know? Dude, that's the fucking beauty of skating right there. Like perfectly described, obviously from like, to, for me, that is it. Because like, dude, you're just out there. And the thing, here, here's what people understand too. Like you need to understand. You said that, you know, sometimes if you're shooting that for a video part, but the thing is skaters do that every day with whether the camera's on or off. Yeah. Right, like that's yeah. What's important, right? Because like, so like right now, me for example, I am very. Uh, I, I've recently become obsessed with endurance sports. I decided I'm going to run a 50 mile ultra marathon in September, and Going I'm a fucking big guy. I'm 215. Like this yeah. shit hurts. So I've been. It's cold here in Missouri, dude, and I've been running like a lot. I'm going to go run six miles when we're done with this in 28 degree yeah. weather, and it's like because I have to. You know what I mean? And yeah. that's like the mental game that like. I've learned from things like skating, from things like business. Dude, yeah. people give up. They'll give up and try tries number two and three failure, yeah. right? Like you gotta yeah. love that shit. You gotta love the process. Well, you I know? think too. I think what a lot of people don't realize is uh, they don't even give themselves enough time to love the process, right? Like when you break down my life, uh, even like when you look at the skating aspect of it, I f I messed up on tricks ninety five percent of the time. I only succeeded 5% of the time. What and, do you remember? And, and I was a professional skater. I got to the highest of my industry, right? I was as, as successful as I could have possibly been. And that was landing tricks 5% of the time. Yeah. All anyone ever remembers is when you land the trick, right? Yeah. So it's like, dude, I, I think a lot of people just don't give themselves enough credit. Like, dude, fail five times fail 10 times, fail a hundred times. It's like, like just what you said about running in the cold, David Goggins, right? Just, so I just he, he's part of, he's part of the, he was the inception of this little obsession that I'm on. Okay. Yeah. So I just finished his book, right? Right. And oh yeah. I saw about, that today. Yeah. And he talks about how you get to 40% where your, your mind goes, no fucking more. I'm done. I'm done. Right. And when you hit that point where your mind goes, I have nothing left. I'm going to die. 
you actually have 60% more to go, right? It's just like we're, we get so wrapped up in our emotions, I think, and what other people think and what, how bad it's going to be if we do fail and what they're going to think of us. It limits us from actually ever fucking running at what we're trying to accomplish. Yeah, man. You know, so because of his book, okay, so dude, I've been bad at running as long as I can remember, right? Like we ran in high school in baseball and like a mile for me, I'd be throwing up and shit. My coaches used to like yeah. hate, hate me because of it. And so by my house, there's a perfect one mile loop, right? And that's where I would start running. I like ran a mile, then I ran two miles and I ran three miles. And then I would always start telling myself around like a mile and a half why I could stop, right? And probably three weeks ago, I was like, fuck it. How can I beat my brain? And I literally just took off three miles in the opposite direction of my house so that I had to run back. And now my new baseline run is six miles. It happened like that. His 40% rule, well, dude, it's real. It's totally real. And I think too, like, you know, just to go back on other people, it's not even so much loving the process. You end up gaining confidence in failing. As weird as that sounds, when you start failing a lot, it gives you confidence that's not as bad as you thought it was, right? It, it can't actually cripple you the way you originally thought. And once you're comfortable with that, it gives you confidence to know like, well, fuck, I could do this. I, I, I can keep doing this and I'm okay in this until I win, right? It's just like, it just really like, I think people just need to like let go of the hang up of like, well, what if I fuck up? <laughs> you know right and it's all it, all it comes down to is uncomfortability and so like for me what's been really powerful in my life is getting when i was very fearful of getting uncomfortable in a certain area like let's say business or whatever like i always think back to like tim ferris in the four hour work week right he talks yeah. about the importance of just like laying down in a public place for a minute for 60 yeah. seconds right yeah. and so i've had a couple of my students do it and the guy came back to me he's like dude i'm more ready to quit my job now this is a guy who wanted to go out on his own uh -huh. And so like getting uncomfortable in one area like has is directly cor correlated with getting uncomfortable in other areas. Totally. Uh, the uncomfortability muscle, like it's just a muscle. It's the same thing. Yeah, I agree. I totally completely agree. hundred percent. Yeah, that's great. Okay. So God, see you and I, you and I can talk. We got good conversation. This is the second time we've had a good conversation. I'm trying to think of where we were. So, okay. So let's talk about St. Archer. Okay. Because this is how a great it started, story. what it meant. Where, where, do you, where do you want me to start from the beginning? It's how it started, yeah, from the beginning. So I went down to San Diego to film this skate video with Josh Landon, who filmed surf videos at the time. Right. And and he had just filmed a surf video about with Timmy Curran, and he took the train from San Diego to San Francisco and stopped at all these surf breaks along the way, right? And that was going to be the premise of the skate film. We would do the same thing, start in San Diego take the train all the way up, up north, stop at certain stops, meet certain pro skateboarders and go skate a spot, right? So San Diego's our first spot. I'm supposed to leave the next day and the forecast shows rain for the next four days. So I'm calling Josh going, dude, there is no point in us going. It's going to rain. I'm trying to abandon the trip at all costs. And he's going, no, you never know. You never know. Finally, I give in. I'm like, fine, dude, let's go. So we drive down there. We get there that night and I get a phone call from a good friend of mine, Mike Mo, uh, and he asked if I wanted to do a sunglass company, which ended up turning into Glassy. They're around today. And, and he tells me, he's like, hey, you wanna do a, a sunglass company? And I was like, well, let me think about it, hang up the phone. And I look at Josh and we had been talking about business the whole way down to San Diego. We're talking about the skate industry. And, uh, and so I asked him like, hey, what do you think about sunglasses? Like, you think that's cool? Should I do this thing? And he goes, well, dude, you know what? Sunglasses are cool, but like they're everywhere in our world. Everyone does sunglasses. Like it'd be cool to do something that's never been done. Right. And this was at like seven o'clock at night. So now I'm not skating. We're just sitting here talking about what new companies we could start that haven't been done. And for the next four hours, we're like going nowhere with it. Right. We get to our hotel room. We're about to turn off the light. I'm sorry. We turn off the light and Josh goes like beer. Like, what about beer? And I click on the light and I'm like, what? Did you say beer? And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, holy shit, that has never been done. Dude, that would actually be pretty cool. Like, we should actually do craft beer. That's like what's blowing up right now. And so we go to, we, we get as much sleep as we can that night. We wake up in the morning, abandon the film, drive home. On our way home, Josh goes, dude, you should hit up your boy P Rod. Like, he invests in the companies, he starts company. Like, let, let's get him involved. So I call Paul. Yo, meet us at Starbucks off Canaan. We've got to tell you about this idea. Pitch it to Paul. By 
three o'clock the following day, we had three, three of us ready to go start a company. And then it took us about next 12 months driving to breweries, meeting with breweries. Uh, originally, we were going to do a contract brew and, and doing all the research that we had to do to figure out what this even meant. At that point, we discovered that we didn't have enough money to do it, that we needed to do a capital raise, had no idea how to do that, called Randy, who introduced me to real estate, who has been like so yeah. influential in my life. And uh, we were like, hey, dude, uh, this is our idea and we have no idea what we're doing. How do we do a business plan? How do we do a capital raise? What's a PPM? What's a subscription? We had no idea. And he set everything up for us, not only set it, everything up for us, educated us in the process. And then we went out and raised money to start this brewery and then ended up raising all the money, started building the brewery, hired employees, uh, and we had a company. Dude, that's great. Okay, and then tell, tell everyone how that ended. Uh, so that uh, ended really well. We ended up selling it to Miller Coors uh, in 2015. Uh, and, you know, the, the majority of our investors were skaters and surfers and snowboarders. Like when we had to do a capital raise, we didn't know money. I didn't even know what a VC fund was, right? right? I called my parents, my wife's parents, all my friends to raise money. And my friends are pro skaters. How much did you have to raise? We had to raise two and a half million on the, on the, the to start it. No shit. Yeah. Great so work. like, great work. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And it was, it was like, it wasn't just me. <laughs> we had a, right. a team of us. I can't take all the credit, but, uh, but it, it worked out really well. Right. And, uh, and so to sell the company and then, you know, have everyone experience such a big acquisition was pretty amazing. No shit, dude. That's yeah, awesome. It was cool. Awesome yeah, story. Thank you. I love it. I thank love you. That story. Yeah. Okay, so 2015, you sell St. Archer to uh, Miller Coors, right? Yeah. What happens next, right? You, you, just have an, you just have an exit, you're chilling, got some money in the bank. Are you still skating in 2015? So I still have sponsors in 2015. Actually, my career has never been bigger. Like 2015, was, I, had, uh, I had a pro shoe out with DC. I had one of the best selling shoes on DC. I was, it was the biggest royalty checks I had ever been getting. Like I had more follow. It was crazy. Right. So I'm going, Holy shit. Like I'm on top. Dolly. We just sold a company. I'm like killing it in the skate world. End up signing another contract with DC. So at this point I had close to like two, almost three years left with my deal with DC. Uh, life was good, man. Life was really good. Right. Right. And then, okay. So I have a question too about the economy of skating, right? So, um, you know, I look at skaters now and it's a little bit different game than it used to be. I know guys who I clearly see making money. Um, and it's from the, you know, the old traditional shoes, video parts and stuff. But now you've got this competition side of skating that was never there with like, well, and I shouldn't say never there because they always have X games, shit like that. Right. But like street league's the real deal now. Yeah. You know, and those guys are getting good checks from Street League. Like, you know, is there a different, like, is everybody shooting for competitions or are a bunch of skaters just not even fucking with that area? Most aren't, actually. Uh, the, thing that, the, the thing that's going on with the skate world is, like, it, it, if we're just talking dollars, right? Right. There's, like, 4%, 5% of pro skateboards are actually making a lot of money. The other 95% aren't making that much. Right? There's a, it's a huge... Uh, gap between the two. So the 5% that are making money on the most part are the 5% in the contest. In the contest, right. And so, okay, so, you, you know, for everyone who doesn't understand skating too, so the, that 95%, like what's the average income of a professional skateboarder who is sponsored by a big company shoots videos? Like the 5%? No, the 95%. The 95% average salary, I'd probably say is between 50 and, now I made 50 and 70 grand maybe a year. Brutal. And that's, so that's just if, that's just if so they're sponsored, no shoe deals. Like they're just basically, they're honestly, basically traveling and skating for free. No, that's included at this point. That's including a lot of guys with shoe sponsors. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So back then you used to make way more off shoe deals and shit. Oh God. Yeah. Oh yeah. Way more. Yeah. Yeah. Like a, you know, an average shoe deal, five years ago it was over a hundred grand for sure. It was 150, anywhere from 150 to, I mean, dude, a million, million plus with some guys. And right? now it doesn't mean shit. 
I'd say an average shoe deal for like the masses is like, dude, 60 grand a year. Damn. Yeah. It's not that much. Damn. But then you have like the outliers now or the, or the small amount that do make a good amount of money. It's just not that much anymore. Yeah. There are guys. I mean, so like, who? let me ask you this. Who's your favorite skater? Of all time? Uh, sure. Let's go all time. Oh, right right let, uh, let's do all, both. All time, my favorite skater is Eric Costin. Ooh, why? Uh, you know what, man? When so it was all from the first video I had ever seen. First video I ever saw was the girl video mouse. Uh, and I don't know why, but Eric Costin's part in that video, I just knew he was the best. Even though like Guy Mariano was the best, Guy Mariano had like a a segment leading up to his part, like a skit that I was always too impatient to watch. So I just always felt like Eric Costin closed the video and forever that sealed him being my favorite skater. And then it ended up turning out that he was the best. And as I got, you know, more knowledge and better at skateboarding, uh, he was actually like the one who was killing it. Yeah. So he was just always my favorite. Gotcha. What about right now? Oh man, right now, I think my favorite skater is probably uh, this kid, Miles Silvas. He's probably my favorite. Mm, I don't know if I know who he is. I don't follow that closely. He's, just, he's like a... He's like one of the newer kids. He's just like sick. He just, he rips. Dude, there's some kids now who like. I mean, like I, I like kind of kind of follow like Zion, right? Like that kid. Oh yeah, Zion. That. Zion's another one. Zion's unbelievable. Ashad is unreal. There's so Ashad. many guys that are. Sick. Dude, Ashad, like that's probably my favorite skater, right? Yeah, now. yeah. You know, when yeah. I was growing up, though, like for some reason, I loved the style of like just all the dudes who skated for Creature. Yeah, just more raw. Yeah, they just skate. They just, I felt like they skated with style, dude. It wasn't that technical. Like, they were skating a lot of bowls and shit. Yeah. And, like, fucking big, like, quarter pipes that were on fire and whatnot. Yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, I always really loved them. But right now, dude, like, I love, like, I straight up love watching Street League because yeah. those guys are just so good. Like, Nice yeah. is so good. Sean Mel so, so good. good. I mean, yeah. dude, P Rod's so just still in the game. Yeah. He's yeah, it's old. funny. Yeah, he is. Dude, P Rod actually two seconds ago had to decline his call. <laughs> he was calling me two seconds ago. Dude, so I mean, he's always really impressed. He's always really impressed me. Um, yeah. You know, in these last five years, just for, I mean, he just doesn't have the body that those guys have. He's been, because he he's just talented. He he's just ta Yeah, he's like, even from when we were kids, he was the best skateboarder I've ever seen. Like, he is just really? like, oh, yeah. He's like the perfect package of like God given talent and and the focus and ability to want to be the best and not stop until he is yeah. he's that he's like the MJ or the Kobe build, you know? Yeah. That's great, dude. That's yeah. great. I, I just love seeing people at the top of their game. I don't care if it's fucking making muffins or skateboarding. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I just yeah. like special the best. Yeah. yeah, I agree. So, so dude, let's get into, um, okay. So when did you s stop being a professional skateboarder? Now you, you talked about, you mentioned something earlier when you were talking about, um the frugality of a skateboarder's career and you're like you know a, a sponsor could just be like later that's exactly yeah what said, yeah that's right? what happened to me <laughs> right so tell us about that so uh so i was uh i had hurt my i, I tore a ligament in my leg uh 2016 and and skated from the beginning of 2016 to the very end with a torn ligament and a fracture in my leg right and and I was like, I just kept pushing through it. At first, I didn't know what it was. I found out what was wrong. And I was worried that like, you know, this last two years might be my last two years to be a pro skateboarder. So I was like, dude, fuck it, man. Maybe I just need to skate in pain till the end. But like, I'm enjoying this, right? End up calling DC. And I was like, hey, look, this is my situation. I'm totally good if I skate through it. Uh, what do you guys think? And they were like, nah, dude, go fix it. Like, you fix your leg. You're out for six months you got a year and a half to like still come back and kill it. You're all good. I'm like, all right, cool. So I, I have surgery December 1st, 2016. I get a call. This is like February 17th, 2017. And uh, DC ends my contract. <laughs> so I'm like, you know, I can't walk. I can't skate. And DC was my sponsor that paid my entire income. And that just went away. And now all of a sudden I'm like faced with the biggest dilemma I've ever had to deal with. Uh, do I spend the next 12 months rehabbing myself and then the next six or 12 months trying to get a sponsor or, or do I look at this as this is, this is the end of the road for me right. and had to make a tough call, dude. It was 
it was gnarly. Yeah, I mean, I mean, dude, you're, you're like you've got a wife, you've got ki- like uh, one kid or a couple kids at this point. Two, uh, I had two kids at this point. Yeah, two kids. Yeah, dude, that's yeah. fucked. It that's gnarly, fucked. Man, it was gnarly. Right? So, so what, what what was going on, like emotions wise? Like, I mean, how long had you had a relationship with DC? I was on DC for five years. Right. I mean, these uh, are like people you've yeah. Fucked with. Hundred percent. Yeah, it was gnarly, dude. It was gnarly. It was there was so much more emotion baked into it than I even realized, though. Uh, really, like when we go back to the beginning and me, like trying to like maximize the amount of money I was investing, the the starting companies, all of this was done to try to be okay after skateboarding, right? I put so much emphasis on the financial arm. Uh, I didn't prepare myself for the emotional roller coaster that was to come with me losing my identity in a sense. Right. Yeah. Like I was not prepared for that. That fucked me up. It brought me to my knees in the most darkest point of my life. And I was forced to like actually discover who I was. Right. It's like, dude, my life was easy until that point, or at least it felt easy. Like even like though I had a lot of failures, it was like, I was always on the rise from, from 18 until 34. My entire career was this. Everything I had done was that. Right. And Same all of a sudden, Bravo, Archer, you know, like everything, everything, right? Like, and, and, and I will say this, that doesn't mean there weren't losses there in that time. There were a lot of companies I started that failed, totally went away. Right. But when you look at the whole package, the whole package was moving up, right? Yeah. Even though there'd be little losses, the whole thing was moving up. When that happened, it felt like I had lost everything. It was like, okay, now you're zero. Right. And it was like, Dude, I, I sometimes have a hard time even describing how, how difficult that was for me. Uh, it was fine. I, I mean, the only thing I explained is like, I had no idea who I was, you know? Yeah. So, That's powerful shit to go yeah. through, dude. I mean, yeah. I, like, I, I'm so grateful. Like, I couldn't, uh, I'm just, I don't think I would have ever been strong enough to go through that with a family. Like, I'm grateful that I have, that I was so fucking gnarly that I had to end up in rehab at 21. You know what I mean? Because yeah. like, if I went through that now with my wife and my kid, dude, like, I mean, maybe I'd get through it. Maybe I'd like, I don't know what would happen. You know, yeah. that's crazy. Yeah, it was gnarly. The thing I will say though, is that, and, and that I did recognize was that like, I viewed this as the defining moment in my life that was either going to make or break me. Right. Fight or flight. It, it was it. Fight or flight. And, yeah. and I'll tell you straight up dog, I am not going to drown. Right. I, let's go. I, I let's go before I drowned. And that's what happened. It was like, and I'm not saying it was easy. I'm not saying I had this moment of like, fuck this. I'm taking this all back. And it was, it, it was a grind, right? Even to this day, it's like every single day has been a grind, but it's like, I just recognize like, okay, do not let this cripple me. Do not let this be the thing that destroys me. And so every day was me inching my way at what I was going to be next. What am I going to do? How am I going to get out of this? Who am I? How do I start filling this void? It was, it was a whole lot of things that I was trying to work through at once. Well, what'd you tell me? It took six months for you to make a move. It took six months for me to even know what the move was, right? Basically in the beginning, I would, I, 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 I took such an ego blow, right? That like the first thing I did was like in this like retaliation mode. How do I get this back? How do I fuck all them up, right? That's like originally like what I was about. It was like, okay, DC had that type of control over me. No one will be able to hurt me again. I'm going to start a shoot. I'm going to fucking blow DC out of the water. That was like my original thing, right? right. Like, dude, start a business plan. Start designing shoes. Start, do we all get all the way to samples from China. And like, I sit here, I'm going, why am I doing this? Like, seriously, <sighs> what am I doing? This isn't me. I, I knew that about me. Like I was in like, emotion or retaliation mode that's that, that is a, a defense mechanism that is there's not nothing that you've I described wanted. about yourself in my short time knowing you that resembles that right it wasn't i was hurt yeah. that's all it was i was hurt and i had an ego and i was trying to fill it with anything i could and it really took a moment of me going dude what what, what am i really missing like what what why did i have an ego what's that void what's this like why do i feel the need of of getting love through praise of a following. Why, why did I feel like I had to be the biggest pro skateboarder to be valued, right? And when I started working through those issues, I got to a place where I could actually do what I felt like I was meant to do. And it wasn't a realization for me, it was me going through this and getting a phone call that triggered an idea is what happened. Yeah. 
So dude, let's talk about some of that though. Like you just described some really important stuff that people have to go through and some of them never like, you know, uh, if I had not gotten sober and been introduced to AA, like introspection would not have been part of the software for me. Like I just yeah. never would have done it. And yeah. a lot of people, they just like, why were you just like, why did you look inward? That's such a, such an advanced thought process, right? Where'd that come you know from? What? Oh, man. So, so to take it a step back and I'm sorry I didn't touch on this. Uh, when I was 27, this is right when all this shit started happening for me, got married, started these businesses. I had a full like turning point in my life. And I, I felt like I grew up a very happy and like somewhat like loving person. The skate industry as a whole is more negative. It's everything is whack. We don't like anyone. It's our world or nothing. Right. And what happened to me is I, I, I started becoming a person that I didn't like. I was or what? about everything, everything. I was like, I turned into the biggest hater. Right. And at 27, I was at this shoe sponsors Christmas party. We're partying, like whatever. I start walking to the hotel. I'm with this whole group of people. And I don't know why this happened. This is two in the morning. I'm walking down. I stop for whatever reason. I sit down and have like this, like, like coming to Jesus moment. Right. Of like, I hated who I was. Absolutely hated it. And like, it brought me to tears. And I was like, you know what? This isn't who I'm supposed to be. I don't know why I've become this, but I am going to stop this. and I'm going to be somebody else. And I'm like sitting under this, like you do the moment felt like yesterday. I'm sitting under this, this, uh, this light, it's dark and foggy. It's shining over me. It was out of the movies. Right. And it was just this, this moment where I was like, I'm done with this. Right. right. So I woke up the next morning and that was the beginning of me becoming this new person, this more happy, like loving, positive person. Right. And if you go back and look at my skate career, I had a lot of, a lot of videos and photos pre 27 where I'm breaking my board, screaming, I'm a terror. And then post I'm always smiling and happy. There was a, a, a absolute moment where it changed for me. Wow. And I think going through that process of trying to be a better person, trying to be more positive, it, 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 I, I saw the results. Just what happened to me when I lost my sponsors was the first time I was like, okay, dude, we're going to see if this shit's real, you know? And, and, yeah. and I think just that, that prior, that 10 year run, I, I knew the power of like, of change. I knew the power of like you d digging deep down inside and looking at your insecurities, looking what holds you back and working through those issues. And I felt the, the power of it. And like, dude, I'll tell you straight up, my career changed at that moment. Not even like the, the energy I was putting out, but like the amount of followers I had, the amount of money I was making, my career tenfold, no doubt about it. Uh, I was going to say, that, that change is like very indicative of why in 2015 your career was at a, at a heightened state. Totally. You know, so I think like going through those experiences, I just, I felt like, you know what, I can do this. It's just going to hurt. And I knew it was all going to be with, with like me digging into like who I am, why I'm here, what's my purpose of like what is at the core of our insecurities. And for me, it was, I think self, like, like I, I didn't value myself. I was, I was experiencing love and value through other people, right? Like affirmation was like, I needed affirmation from other people to feel worth anything. Right. And it's like, I had to like find out why that was happening to be able to, I think, work through these issues. So important, dude. You know how many fucking young guys like feel that same thing? I've been there. Yeah. You've been there. Like, dude, yeah. everybody looks for that external. And like what I like people like you or I who have been through it and have dug deep, like the power is already there in you. Yeah. You, ha you have to dig it out. Yeah. Look, I'm, I'm at, at this point, I'm absolutely 100% convinced by this. The more you know about yourself, right? The more control you can have over yourself the more successful you're going to be in every aspect of life. Uh, at this point, that's what I think. Like if I'm basing my success, I completely base it on how much I know about myself and how many things that hold me back I can get rid of. Yeah. You know? Dude. And that's like, so that's why Goggins book and like his whole ethos was so powerful for me because I just popped open the hood from a mental toughness standpoint and didn't like what I saw. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and so like I just set out to change it, and like that idea, like when I told you, I just like 
doubled my max run by just doing some other shit like that. It's like, how much am I leaving on the table yeah. with my wife, with my yeah. business, right? Like if yeah. my fucking brain told me that I could only run three miles when I could actually run six, right? Like, yeah. Totally. A hundred percent. Yeah. The Goggins looks powerful, man. I think like more than anything, like when I, uh, dude, I had a really good life. My parents are, are both together, raised us like, dude, as far as my child upbringing, it was as good as it could possibly be. Right. And so the, the thing that's so rad about him is like, he is the exact opposite of that. Like his life was as bad as it could be. And to take yeah. that type of pain and emotion and be able to turn him to where like, he is like this, this person that you and I are looking up to going, holy crap, we can do more. That's powerful. That, that relates to everyone, you know? And I think like, mm -hmm. uh, dude, I think that book is, I mean, dude, it's, it's incredible. Yeah. Best. Uh, so I finished it right before the end of the year and uh, best book I read in 2018 by far. And I probably read a hundred books. Yeah. I don't know, same exact way. Yeah. yeah like, um, okay, so, you know, you make it through this experience. You almost fucking start a shoe company to say, fuck yeah. me. Yeah. And then, uh, so, so what happens? Let's get into what you're doing now, right? Before we wrap up. Like, that's important, right? Yeah. So, what are you focused on? So, so there's two things I'm doing, but, but the, the one thing that, like, I think changed the game for me was when I was working through this, like, the, these, these inner workings of myself, I got a phone call from a friend who's another pro skateboarder asking how I was doing. Right. And he was just like, like, what's your deal, man? Like, are you alive? Like no one's seen you like what's up. And so I kind of just told him everything. I just told you all this hard shit I was working through how hard life was. And, and he had kind of brought up a point to me. And the, and the big thing I was missing was, you know, he was like, look, dude, look how thankful you should be thankful. Like, look how blessed you are. You have a wife, two kids, a home, you haven't made a dollar in five, six months. And like, you're okay financially. Like, dude, I hope I could go through that when I, when I get to the end of my career. Like, that's amazing. Right. Yeah, you told, you told me this. I mean, dude, there was probably guys you came up with who are just not in a good spot right now. Dude, 95% of them. Right. right. The masses of our industry don't keep doing this. Right. So it was like that phone call is like what did it for me where I was like, dude, I know what you're talking about. I know that pain point because I felt it for 15 years. The only reason I'm in this situation is because of that pain point that you just touched on. Right. So it, it really became like, dude, how do I fix this? Like, how do I help my friends and the generations to come to experience a transition that was more like mine, which was awful. Not gonna say it was it was awful. Yeah, but I I, 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 I want to pause you. I want to pause you real quick. Like, tell the listeners, like for me, dude, the simplicity of what actually happened. Like, you could have come to that conclusion by like making a gratitude, like just focusing on gratitude, right? Yeah. Yep. A hundred percent. I took a phone call. I I wasn't there. And dude, I'll yeah. tell you, Strip, this is somebody who practices this every day, and I yeah. still wasn't there because I let emotion and insecurity block the way I thought. Right? When we're ruled by emotion, we are useless. When we're blocked by fear and insecurity, we're useless. And in those moments, I was useless, 100%. Right? And I just needed that phone call or whatever it was to trigger that out of me and go, dude, what are you doing? This isn't how you think. And the second I switch back over, it's been a completely different ride. You know, so basically, long story short, uh, I set out to want to fix the issue of skateboarders, snowboarders, surfers, living these like super impactful lives and having all this influence and, and wanting to help them get through the transition uh, smoothly. And so I wanted to create an opportunity for these guys. And that opportunity in my mind and what really helped me get through it was real estate. And so I created a real estate fund, uh, which began me trying to create opportunity for my friends. Uh, mm -hmm. Ended up, I very quickly realized that this message I'm talking about doesn't just relate to athletes there's a whole lot of people in this world that do jobs they're not passionate about that are on the hamster wheel that don't want to work every day that want to choose to work uh so so this fund has grown into something uh bigger than i even set out to to do uh maybe not do but my my sole reason was to help skaters it's just it's become bigger than that now it's just more broad of i'm trying to just help people now so this is uh, this is commune capital, right? This is commune capital. Yeah, that, that that's the vehicle. Um, tell everybody. So like, I mean, I I know what you're doing currently. Like, are you like taking on investors? Like, are you guys? How active are you guys in the market? What are you doing? You know? Yeah. What's going on with that? 
Yeah, so we're a real estate fund. So we do have investors. Right now, I think we have about 40. Uh, we invest majority into multifamily apartments. Um, everything for us is a value add play. Either it's a rehab or a renovation or a development. Anything we could physically add value to is, uh, is where we participate in real estate. Uh, we also do storage units uh, and mixed use properties, but our main focus is multifamily. Um, yeah. And for at this moment right now, uh, I can only have accredited investors, uh, which I'd be completely no, no. with you. Kills me, absolutely kills me. Accredited investor is somebody who makes uh, a annual salary of 200K a year, or uh, if you're married, you have a joint salary of 300K a year, or you have a net worth over a million, not including your primary residential, right? right. It's exclusive, which I don't like. Um, so we are, uh, we're looking at, uh, opportunities for us to, uh, have everyone participate for me. I've always like when I was skating and I was a pro, I'd be the dude that brought 50 of my friends to the spot. I'm always, I have more fun with people. So that is, uh, just to be totally real with you, man, that is like my problem solved right now is how I can have more people involved than I have now. So I, I, don't, I don't know anything about like, uh, you know, the regulations. So what do you have to do to be able to take on non-accredited investment? It has to be a different fund. Right now it's a Reg D offering. It would convert gotcha. into a Reg A plus. Gotcha. Um, yeah, it's, uh, look, it's funny, man. This is the, I, co I come from being a pro skateboarder and then building brands, right? I've had nothing ever hold me back. I've had social media where I'm straight to the people. It, it's been startups, Stop. right? Yeah. This is the first time in my life where I'm restricted or held back in a sense because of us being regulated by the SEC. And, and so there, this is a new space for me. That's, uh, at times I don't like, uh, it feels a little slow and a little corporate, which I don't like. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but being able to market funds, especially through social media is so new that I actually don't mind being on the forefront of this transition and, and just figuring out new ways to work around uh, challenges. Yeah. I mean, that's great. Yeah. You're playing a totally different ball game, uh, but through the vehicle of creating a lot of impact for a lot of young athletes, which you're going to do. I, I mean, Super good, yeah. dude. Great. Thank work. you. So, and then I just got to give a, one more quick plug, man. So, uh, plug I, do have, I do have a brand called Avni Intelligence, which, which I would actually, we should talk about having you on our podcast. We do a podcast. Uh, we have digital products. We are uh, giving entrepreneurs the tools they need to build a brand in this digital era. Okay. And so, there is what I ultimately, my ultimate goal is, and I know you didn't ask me this, ask me this question. Now I'm just like no. answering questions. Go for it. <laughs> um, my ultimate goal is like, you know, when I started heavy with commune, I'm, I, I skipped a huge stage, right? I, I'm attracting people who have already made a lot of money and are trying mm -hmm. to grow wealth, Right. And, and what happened is I had a lot of people ask me, well, dude, how do I start investing in real estate if I don't make money? Yeah. Right. So, so I wanted to create something that bridged the gap to where I could go, hey, look, this, these are great tools for you to make money. And then once you're making money, these are the vehicles you want to invest into. So uh, those are my two focuses are uh, Commune Capital and Obby Intelligence. And then I have a skateboard brand called Sovereign that uh, is, uh, it's a pass it's passionate for me. I love doing it because I want to stay connected to skateboarding. So those are my right. three things. Yeah. All right. So uh, tell me a little bit about Sovereign. Like what's the, I mean, you want to grow that big? Like, is it just purely a connection to skating? Like, uh, I'll tell you this straight up and if there's going to be some people that don't like this answer. <laughs> um, I personally don't care if it is the biggest skate company in the world or not. I don't care at all. For me, I want something that is just, it could break even for its entire existence. And I feel like it would be a huge win. I want something that, that keeps me connected to skateboarding keeps me in touch with the culture, where the design is, something that I'm proud of, and that is all with it. Love it, love it. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I, want to, I want to wrap things up here. Dude, this has been a great conversation. Like, Thank you, I appreciate I, it, yeah. You I, dropped I, a, I think a ton so. of bombs on people, and I, I mean, I can't, I can't wait to put it out. So why don't you tell everyone where they can find you? I'm gonna link it in the show notes, but tell everyone where they can find you, Commune, the other, uh, Avni and Sovereign, yeah. Yes, yeah, tell so, me all of it. Best way to find me and the thing I'm most active on is Instagram, it's just my name, Mikey Taylor. Um, I have everything else, Facebook, Twitter, 
uh, LinkedIn, but find me on Instagram. You'll be able to find anything else. Uh, my company, if you want to, uh, get information on real estate investing through us, it's communecapital.com uh, and it's commune capital, Instagram, Avni intelligence, Avni intelligence.com. And then sovereign is sovereign.la. Sovereign.la. Okay. And then, so one thing that I like to uh, have at the end, if you had to drop one piece of advice on the young middle of the road entrepreneur, maybe making 70 to 150 grand, like what is it? Mikey Taylor, let's hear it. Oh man, what's the, what's the knowledge I could drop on them? What's, what's the sauce? What's your one thing that if they had to focus on, this is it? Oh man. Uh, I'm going to say something that was very specific to me. Mm -hmm. I spent too much time trying to build what I saw, right? Like I would see something done by somebody else and that was my bar of what I could do. I felt like I was like, I, I needed like, self-approval from from what existed and it took me a long time to feel comfortable with myself to go i don't care if people don't like this i don't care if it's different than the normal i'm putting out this and i'm sticking by it uh, i feel like if i would have had that mentality back then i would have been able to do way more as far as raising the bar uh which really came down to my insecurities man like that i, I think that at the core of it is what i would tell people kill your ego absolutely 100 percent. kill that fucking thing and know what your insecurities are and don't let those things hold you back because business is hard as shit without that gone. This is brutal. So the quicker you can get rid of those things, the easier this is going to be. And that's based on it just not being easy. So get rid of roadblocks, right? Right. Dude, great job. Great job. Well, we appreciate you coming on. We're going to link everything that you gave us. We're going to make sure that everybody has the opportunity to find you now. All the listeners, you know where you can find me at Brody Kern on Instagram, B-R-O-D-I-E-K-E-R-N. And we will see you guys on the next episode. See you, Mikey. Later, buddy.